We have Daniel Holden. It's a great pleasure. Daniel is a researcher at Ubisoft in Montreal. Um, he did his PhD at the University of Edinburgh under supervision of Taku Komura. Daniel does research on machine learning and deep neural networks with applications to game development. Specifically, he does research on animation and character control. Um, we are looking forward to your talk, Daniel. Thanks a lot. Um... You guys can see that? Yes. Great. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about robotic characters in video games. Um, first a bit of background. So yeah, uh, I work for Ubisoft La Forge. So it's a research lab at Ubisoft and we work on the intersection of uh, the academic world and the industry. So we're trying to um, essentially build prototypes which are using things from the academic world, which we think are going to be promising for games. Um, so there's a lot of unique challenges working in this little area of intersection. Um, uh, so before we get started, I'm going to show you a little trailer from uh, a recent Ubisoft game, which was released. Some of you may not have played video games in a while. This will give you a sense of what they're looking like these days. Um, tell me if it's too loud. Had a good run there for a while. Now it's all right. Bombings. And people thrown in cages like animals. Oh, and who could forget the killer robots everywhere? So yeah, that's all gone a bit shit. It's up to us to take our city back. Thing is, we can't do it alone. We need to recruit a resistance. I know what you're thinking. Where do we start? Open your eyes and take a look around. Look here. Look at him. No, not him. Him. Former MI5. Duty never ends. He can get anywhere and erase anyone. See her? Let's kick those bastards out of London. She got kicked out of Oxbridge Robotics School for teaching him to uh, reproduce. <laughs> and that fellow over there, proper belly. Come on, come at me. He'll crack your skull just for looking at funny. What am I gonna do tonight? Makes me feel all right. had better be fucking good. And allow me to introduce you to the deadliest of the lot. She's not old, she's experienced. Like I said, you can recruit anyone, and I mean bloody anyone. Him, her, everyone is a secret weapon. Find them, recruit them. Build the resistance. Let's unfuck this world. So, you know, uh, Video games, they used to be, uh, maybe you have one thing, you have a racing game, you have a shooting game. Now what players really expect is uh, a, a whole world which they can immerse themselves in with all of these things to do inside that world. So the scope of these games has just gone crazy. And the amount of uh, content and work that goes into producing them is insane. So part of uh, our job at the research lab is to try and see how can we make that process more scalable? How can we make things better um, and always keep pushing the boundaries? Uh, as you guys probably know, game development has extremely high performance constraints. So uh, if you're running at 60 FPS, that means you have 16 milliseconds per frame. Um, and some of the older consoles only have eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, 
And that might seem uh, not too bad, but you know, this is shared between hundreds of developers. So what you're really getting for your system is something closer to 160 microseconds uh, of, of, uh, of time on the CPU or 80 megabytes of memory. And in fact, you know, lots of the memory is taken up by sound um, and lots of the, uh, the CPU time is taken up by the rendering. So uh, if you want to have more than 160 microseconds, you probably need to go around and persuade some developers that your job is more important than their job. So it's, it's really, really tightly constrained when we're talking about what we can actually try and ship in a game. Um, there's also very high quality constraints. So uh, this is a slide I used to show comparing Bayek from Assassin's Creed Origins to some of the latest research in, uh, in generative adversarial networks. So you can see, although these generated faces are really impressive, if you put them in a game, I don't think the players would think they looked so impressive. Um, but perhaps interestingly now, you know, even just a few years later, uh, everything has changed and now we can see some incredibly realistic results. So this kind of showcases as well how quickly some of these things are moving in academia and how we can go from something that's completely impossible to ever ship to something that looks like it would work basically in just a span of a couple of years. Um, we also have huge amounts of data that goes into making games. So we have um, animations, we have assets, textures, models. We also have things like code, which can be really interesting data sets. And we want to try and make the best use of all of this data, try and reuse it um, and use things like machine learning to, to basically exploit the fact that we have so much interesting data. So I, I work mainly on the animation side of things. And I think it's fair to say animation in games has typically been somewhat neglected compared to graphics. So here's a little clip from Assassin's Creed Origins. And you can see this character on the right is doing a couple of weird things. So he's kind of turning around fast. He's actually clipping through the plinth here. And the way he transitions to a Sid is also kind of a bit bizarre and not that natural. And we're so used to seeing these things in games that we just ignore them now. You know, this sort of thing happens hundreds of times every time you're playing a game and uh, we sort of learn to ignore them. But it's kind of really a shame that they're still there. If these are graphical glitches, I don't think people would tolerate them nearly as much. So our kind of hypothesis for how we can improve game animation kind of fundamentally is that animation approximates physics. So you can think of Disney's 12 principles of animation. Lots of these things are actually um, to do with physical things like um, inertia or deformation or forces. Um, so if we can actually use physics, it seems like we can remove lots of these glitches. And when we see these sorts of glitches, it really breaks immersion straight away. So as soon as you see something like this happening, you're like 100% certain that you're playing a video game and that this character is not really there. He's just like kind of like a flip book, just playing back an animation, but he doesn't really exist in the real world. So uh, the idea is that uh, what if we actually physically simulate the character as if it were an articulated robot? So this is where you know robotics can come into video games. And this is a very powerful idea, but there are some big questions around this. So will this be able to, will this robot be able to follow the reference animation we give it naturally? Can it be uh, controlled responsively by a player? Can the player be you know, using the gamepad to turn the character left and right and the robot be reacting straight away? And can this be done at interactive rates with the sort of constraints I presented earlier? Is it even possible to simulate an articulated robot under these constraints? So these are the three questions we're really looking at in our research. Um, there's a whole bunch of previous work we can take inspiration from. Lots of these are more from the graphics community, but basically people have studied this idea for a long, long time, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, and in particular, deep reinforcement learning has really proven itself to work particularly well in this simulated environment. Um, but there hasn't been much of a focus on things like responsiveness or the runtime cost. So for example, we can see here in these two papers, uh, the arrow is changing and telling the character to turn, but it can take like, you know, five or 10 seconds or something before the character actually does 
what the player wants. So this is obviously not responsive enough for video games. So when we started looking at this, we built a few little prototypes, which I thought might be interesting to show um, to you guys. The first prototype we did was simply to see if it's possible to track a reference animation. So here we have some animation coming from motion capture and we have a simulated character and we want to just see, can it follow that animation? So we did some open loop trajectory optimization uh, where the actions here are the PD offsets. So we copy over the joint angles from the motion capture data and use these as the initial PD targets. And then we add offsets to these. And we found this actually works pretty well. It works pretty much any animation we throw at it, but it's extremely slow to compute this trajectory optimization. So just doing a couple of minutes takes, uh, takes hours. So we also looked at um, MPC based methods. So we built this little toy environment. Here you can see the green is the target position for this simulated character. And we can pull him away and he's gonna go and try and get back to that target position um, using MPC. But again, this was uh, very expensive because it requires doing these physics rollouts. So we did another test about whether we could learn to approximate the result of these uh, physics rollouts. So here you can see a neural network trained to approximate the result of the simulation. So in yellow is the neural network result and in red is the real simulation result. So we can see how changing the initial state is gonna change the result of the, of the rollout. But we found even though you can see it's working pretty well in this little toy setup, uh, it was really difficult to scale to larger characters and make more performance. So we sort of stopped this direction of research um, at this point. The next thing we did was we switched to using like a closed loop framework and we used PPO to learn a policy rather than uh, optimizing for actions directly. Um, and this works pretty well. So again, we can track very long animations. Um, so here the state includes the target pose we want to track um, and the actions of the PD offsets again. And we also improved our character model. So here we can see we can follow this animation pretty nicely with this simulated character. Um, and this also worked pretty well for any animations we tried. So we had hopping and get ups and stumbles, lots of different animations. Um, but it was not very robust at all. So uh, if we throw a cube at this guy, even if it's fairly light, he still might fall over. But perhaps more importantly, although we could track individual animations, this didn't mean we had a controllable character you could direct. So the kind of key uh, thing we needed to focus on with our next part of research was how can we put this kinematic controller inside the training process? So what I mean is how can we put the, the actual animation system we're using in the game uh, inside this uh, training process for the physically based character? So now I'm gonna pass over to uh, Kevin to talk about the next part. So Kevin is, uh, he's been working at La Forge for a few years now, working on physically based animation. Uh, he completed his, uh, his master's at McGill um, and he was working previously as a control engineer. Um, so yeah, let me pass over to Kevin. I will stop, stop sharing now. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. So uh, this part of the presentation is going to be focusing on this physically based character control method we developed called Dracon. Uh, and we published this in SIGGRAPH Asia in, I believe, 2019. So if you want to read the paper, you'll find it online. So what is Dracon to start, right? Uh, it's not really an acronym, but it stands for Data-Driven Responsive Control for Physics-Based Characters. Uh, and you can see it in action in this video. So the white colored character on the left over here is just a standard kind of kinematically controlled character you'd find in a video game. Uh, and the blue character on the right is physically simulated. 
Uh, and you can see a user is controlling the white character and the blue character is following it quite well. Um, so what's interesting is that we don't know a, a priori what the white character is going to do. It's not like we're just uh, following a trajectory. This trajectory is changing because the user is unpredictable. Um, so this is where the responsiveness, uh, responsive control, I guess, part comes in, right? You have to be able to actually adapt to an unknown disturbance, which is the player, uh, and match the animation as quickly as possible without losing uh, like stylistic uh, properties of the animation without falling over. So we're pretty happy with the result we got with this method. Uh, if you do this little A-B test, it's kind of hard to tell uh, which character is simulated and which is kinematic. They're both skinned to look exactly the same, but one of them is a traditional kind of game animation system. And the other one is fully physically simulated. It's an articulated robot, essentially, in simulation. Um, so you may be able to tell, but it's actually quite hard, I think. Um, the one on the left was animation, and the one on the right was physically based. And again, having the responsive control lets you do some precise movements, which is really important to players. Uh, I think it's a big deal in uh, just the game world to have something that does exactly what you want when you ask it to. Uh, and one of the tests we use to show this in the paper is uh, following this kind of path on the ground. So a user is given a gamepad and they're asked to trace out this, this um, kind of path, right? Uh, and you can see you can do quite well. So even with these kind of sharp turns and cornering and smooth turns, the player is able to relatively well follow this path on the line. There's some overshoot and little things like this. Part of it is uh, it's hard to do like these perfect geometric figures with your hands. Um, and another part is there is still a small delay just because uh, like players, players expect their character to almost be superhuman in video games, right? Uh, like turn on the spot. Uh, instantly and stop all of their like decelerate at infinite speeds like there's lots of these little uh, artifacts of games being something meant to be fun rather than realistic that are hard to actually mimic um, but that's kind of the purpose of why we uh, moved in this direction of responsiveness with this work uh, another big part was we wanted the runtime cost to be reasonable so you don't have a very big budget for these kinds of systems in a game, like Daniel was saying. Uh, and we wanted to see how small we could get all this control, planning, um, uh, simulation, all this stuff to happen, right? Uh, and we were actually able to do quite well. So you can see here in this figure, we do a little breakdown of the costs on pretty standard hardware, no, no like crazy machines, right? Um, and we can do it all in about 340 microseconds, which is quite good considering we're doing some heavy control stuff that 10 years ago would uh, basically take an entire machine's compute budget to do, right? Uh, so how does this actually work? What's interesting is that our planning comes entirely from so, um, this type of traditional animation system you have in a game. We don't have any um, consideration of what the dynamic constraints on the character is. So this seems kind of odd at first, like why would you want to plan without uh, taking dynamics into account? One reason is it's a lot cheaper. You don't actually have to think about anything. You can just look at your giant database of animation and do a really cheap search and pick out the right plan. Um, and then this is all fed to a reinforcement learning based policy, right? That, well, a policy that's trained with reinforcement learning. And this policy basically handles all the low level kind of planning details that you need to actually make this animation possible in the dynamic simulation. So it solves for like balancing, like adjusting the animation to achieve balance and do these kinds of little effects, right? Um, so what are these kinematic planners? I think because it's a big part of our method, it's worth actually going in depth how these things work, what they are. Uh, and I don't think necessarily the robotics community has a lot of uh, experience with these things because it's more of a, like a game, uh, game related research right so just a little overview right we have different kinds of character controllers that are used in games um, and there's some where the memory usage grows with the data set so these are things like state machines blend trees graph based methods kernel based methods and one you're seeing a lot these days is motion matching um, on the other hand you have the more academic side where the memory usage is fixed you have things like linear models neural network based methods uh, these are like the state of the art in academia, right? 
You have uh, like Daniel's previous work, face function neural networks, uh, and a variety of other work, mode adaptive networks, things like this. So these are nice generative models that produce a lot of interesting um, output, but they're relatively expensive to run. They're kind of hard to work with. And for this reason, you see um, production side, the production side is more focused on using these more uh, algorithmic approaches, I guess, and motion matching being the one that usually uh, you see in new games in the last five, 10 years. So you could see For Honor was a big one. Um, a lot of the EA Sports games, The Last of Us, all these games have been using motion matching for quite a while now. Uh, and the idea with motion matching, uh, I guess the, the like key idea, if you were to distill it down to one sentence, is that you regularly search for the frame which best matches what the user is asking for. Um, how that actually works is you have gameplay where the user is sending some kind of control. Uh, here I have a gamepad, but sometimes it's something a little more abstract. Um, and you boil this down into something which you, you usually call the trajectory, right? Um, so it's not necessarily like a trajectory of a simulated character or anything. It's really just like uh, what the user asked for in a 2D plane in the past, uh, like one second, right? And then you have your animation database, which is just a ton of motion capture, maybe like 10 hours of motion capture, different behaviors, different styles, different dance cards where the player, where the actor was running around in different patterns on the ground. You're trying to capture basically every possibility of human motion, uh, which isn't necessarily feasible, but you can get a lot of the core behaviors that you want to see in your game. Uh, and this gives you this database, which you can break down into trajectories and poses. Um, so this gets fed in uh, the desired trajectory, and you want to find what in your database looks like this trajectory you're asking for. You also have the current pose, which is coming from your game, right? Your character is doing something right now, and you don't want it to change too much. Uh, so this kind of keeps uh, some temporal consistency. So you also want to look for the animation in your database, which matches this trajectory, but also matches this pose. So you have these two kind of queries that you're making and you do some kind of search over your database. And it turns out you could do a really simple kind of nearest neighbor search and this works well. Uh, so you pick your closest match and this gives you essentially what you want your character to do. So you update your current pose and you move the character based on the animation you picked with some kind of blending. Uh, and you want to do this repeatedly, but you don't want to do it every frame. So you have a little search delay, you play the animation with blending, and then after maybe half a second or maybe like, a, I don't know, 100 microseconds, you update your pose and your trajectory based on the new requirements from gameplay, the new pose from updating your animation. And you just repeat this process over and over again. Uh, so here you can see a little clip from For Honor. The blue on the ground is what the player asked for, and now it's looking through all the animations. Uh, and it wants to find the one that essentially mimics this trajectory as well as possible. So there was no animation in the database necessarily where the character is doing this kind of walk along this trail on the ground, but by continually blending and picking new animations, you're actually capable of coming up with an animation that looks almost exactly like motion capture because it's blending tons of different clips continuously and keeping this temporal consistency in the poses. Uh, so what is this? Uh, trajectory we're talking about really we call them features uh, in our lab but essentially you have things like the 3d foot positions and velocities the hip global velocity and the trajectory positions and orientations at points in the future maybe 20 40 60 frames ahead um, and these are the positions the player is asking for so these are really like the joystick made a little turn and we want character in the next 60 frames to do a turn kind of like this. We do a lot of little heuristics to get that right, but that's the core idea, I guess. Uh, but how do you actually do this algorithmically, right? Uh, and what it really boils down to is, again, nearest neighbor search. So you're trying to find the nearest point to a query point in a high dimensional space. Um, so your current pose, your trajectory, that's really just a big vector in RN. Uh, and this gives you a point in RN, right? Uh, your animation data, this is a bunch of different poses and trajectories. These are all points as well in RN. Um, and because you're actually breaking up an animation every frame into a new trajectory and pose, you actually get a new vector for every single frame of animation. And that's nice because your, your changes in these vectors are actually quite gradual with time. So you end up getting 
these paths through through the hyperspace, right? These kinds of uh, like sequences of lines, and there's a nice little structure you can exploit. Uh, and then when you do your nearest neighbor search, right, you're really just finding the nearest point on this thread um, to your query point. So like I said, like you, you have um, your animation broken down into frames and every frame, the trajectory is similar, but a little bit different, maybe a few dimensions. So you get these nice little thread like structures. Um, and what you can do to play your animation, one of the easy ways, right? You just jump directly to that pose, jump directly to that animation and you start playing it. But you don't want this because it creates um, some kind of uh, inconsistency, right? In your animation, the character is gonna be popping. Uh, so what you do instead is you do some little blend over time, maybe uh, over 0.5 seconds, you exponentially blend towards the animation. And that's helped smooth out some of those uh, sharp changes that you would get if you were just doing a, a naive projection. Um, and how do you actually control the character when you're just searching through a database? Um, well, the user is steering this trajectory with the joystick, essentially. So they're able to influence the position of this query point in space. And this lets it essentially pick between different threads through the space. Uh, if you have a specific constraint that you really want to enforce, you could just emit data from the search. So let's say you had a particular direction you wanted to move, but you wanted to be running rather than walking. Well, then you clip out all of the, you you'd omit all of the animation where you're walking from the search. And then you're by design just forced to pick only from the set of data where you're running. Um, and this can basically constrain you to particular behaviors. Uh, another important idea when you're dealing with motion matching is that you want to search as infrequently as possible. So in terms, it's kind of a fight, right? If you want it to be responsive, you'd want to search very frequently. But this is dangerous because you can fall into these, into these cycles of matching. So I have a little visualization, right, of what this means. It's a bit abstract, but once you progress the animation, you might move a little bit forward toward the, towards this red point. But even after one frame, maybe your closest uh, match is still a point, the same point that you matched previously. Um, and maybe now, if you were to pick that point again, you jump back to where you were. Uh, and now again, you have the same point as your nearest neighbor. So you can get stuck in kind of these infinite loops where the character just freezes in a certain pose if you're searching too frequently. Uh, there's different ways to combat this. You could constrain it to not search the same area of space, but really the easiest way and what seems to work the best is to just reduce your search rate a bit so that you can move forward and you'll match a point a bit further in the future. Um, and a nice thing, right, with this thread-like structure um, that you get from the kind of just the way data lies in the hyperspace is that you can optimize it with acceleration structures. So it's always nice to be able to exploit underlying structure in your data to speed things up. Um, you could use a KD tree, but actually this is kind of, uh, it, it doesn't work as well as just using bounding volume hierarchies because you have this structure and a lot of points are actually locally very close together. You can just fit things into bounding volumes and then searching the bounding volumes ends up being very fast. Uh, that's how we get our search speeds so slow among other ways. I mean, so fast among other uh, other tricks that we use. Um, and like I said previously, we're trying to query a realistic desired trajectory. Um, so this is somewhat of a heuristic, right? You, you wanna provide what the character is gonna do in the next 20, 40, 60 frames. But this is tricky because you don't actually have you're not actually using animation to, to do this. Uh, so what we do is we just try to create a smooth line uh, with some curving, some nice curvature. Uh, and this should basically match what a human or, or what the center of mass is essentially doing in the motion capture data. So you don't want like instant abrupt changes in direction because this is unrealistic. You're not gonna find very good matches if you do that. So there's a little bit of tweaking you have to do in terms of uh, just what you're actually asking for to get something more realistic. Uh, and you get quite nice results when everything is set up, tuned properly. You can see here, uh, we're able to do things like over walking over rough terrain, interacting with other characters, uh, steering different char character morphologies like a dog, uh, and matching even things in the environment like the position of these chairs. Um, so it's, it's, it works quite well, this motion matching uh, technology, and it's way um, 
I'd like to say it's, it's a very simple idea, right? You're just doing nearest neighbor search. There's no neural networks involved. It's really just searching over your data. So you know exactly what you're going to get. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the like training, learning, and control part of our, uh, of our research, right? So in terms of actually uh, like the reinforcement learning bit in Dracon, we use PPO and we kind of do the standard deep mimic kind of reward where you're trying to match a particular pose um, and you do a reference state initialization, you do early terminations. Uh, I guess the interesting part in terms of training is that we have this idea of an artificial player. So in our environment, um, there's actually a disturbance and this is the player. Um, so the dynamics are not, um, they're not deterministic anymore, right? You have this stochastic element. The player can do anything at any time and this is going to lead to your character falling over a lot because if you ask to pivot immediately, now this might be an unphysical motion and the controller has to compensate. But you don't want the player to be too random because now you're going to kind of um, be learning out of distribution behavior and it's not going to work very well. It's just going to learn the most robust strategy. So you, we had to find kind of a middle ground where the disturbance is not too severe, but it actually properly models the distribution of what players are going to do. And the idea we came up with for this is to actually have uh, a simulated game pad, which an artificial player interacts with, and there's events that can occur uh, each frame, which modify the behavior of the game pad for the next uh, remainder of time until a new event occurs. So this probability of an event occurring can be tuned. And the different events we have are more like toggleable events that change the state for a prolonged period rather than instantaneously. Uh, so one of these is to randomly change the value of the move direction or the heading direction. We could control move direction and heading direction independently to do things like walking backwards, strafing, uh, skipping sideways, um, to deactivate and activate certain stylistic states. So this is crouching, running, these types of styles. Uh, and we want to hold these until a new activation or deactivation event occurs. Another event is to just set the desired uh, direction or heading to zero immediately. Um, so this is a common thing. The player is just going to want to stop on the spot. Uh, and an important one as well is to have a turn rate for the move direction and heading direction. So a player, uh, we've noticed that they very often like to do kind of smooth swooping motions with the joystick. Uh, so we actually have rates for this that can be set independently of the direction. Uh, and with this, we get these kinds of random walks through space uh, that last around 20 seconds. The player starts at some position. They start wandering around, running, strafing, doing all kinds of little behaviors. But it's not uh, like extremely high frequency, right? So we have these uh, like kind of a natural random walk through the space rather than something that's overly noisy that would be very hard to actually uh, learn anything useful with. Uh, and yeah, we give a bonus upon completion. We do early termination if we fall too far from the reference trajectory. Uh, PPO, why did we use PPO? I guess it just has proven performance in previous work. Uh, so we see it working in DeepMimic. We see it working in other previous papers. Uh, we don't care so much about sample inefficiency because we're not on a real robot. Uh, we can essentially sample for free right It'll, if it takes a little bit longer we don't care too much as long as the algorithm is stable and nothing bad happens right um, and even with ppo and its sample inefficiency we still get pretty modest training time so even for the most complicated behaviors the maximum is around 30 hours on our standard kind of user hardware that we have uh, so a little bit of results now i guess um, so here's just a standard little video of the character running around with the skinned mesh. Uh, and it's interesting to just see how nice the contacts are, uh, how the pivots work. So we don't know a priori when we're gonna turn, but we're still able to resist this kind of disturbance of an unexpected change uh, in the animation we're requesting. Uh, and we can also withstand significant perturbations outside of what we trained with. Uh, so here is like a kind of ball and chain on the character's ankle and he's able to withstand, uh, he's able to walk with it, even though he wasn't trained with it. Uh, if it's relatively heavy, if it's kind of ridiculously heavy, he falls over eventually, but 
even then it works surprisingly well and it looks quite natural, right? We're getting this kind of animation of a character struggling to pull something that wasn't in our database purely from the control and simulation interacting. Uh, and a kind of nice, nice uh, demo, I guess, of any um, legged locomotion is to just whip cubes at the character and see how they react. Uh, so this video is interesting. We weren't trained to withstand these cues, but you can see the character is able to stumble over them and withstand pretty pretty significant perturbations that knock him off balance. Uh, but he still regains control, and the player is able to steer around relatively well. Uh, so here it's not so bad, right? There's a cube maybe every second, uh, but here that's kind of ridiculous. So there's a storm of objects hitting the character, and he's still able to run around, stay upright, uh, walk over this really rough terrain. Uh, without falling like for a significant amount of time i mean eventually uh <laughs> it's kind of i think even a even a, a real person would fall over under these kinds of conditions so <laughs> i think it's reasonable that he falls over eventually uh and what's interesting it's not in our paper but um we did a bit of uh, a presentation on this stuff at gdc at one point is we eventually adapted our method to work over rough terrain uh, so we modified motion matching to actually pick animations from a database with rough terrain uh, and trained on this kind of environment that you see here. Uh, and the results were surprisingly good. So here's a little demo. We have a character walking over a kind of loose objects and rubble. Uh, and there's even like a moving platform that he's standing on. He's able to resist the uh, like Coriolis centrifugal forces that are throwing him off that balance, right? Um, so that's really cool, I think, to see that we can adapt the method to work with more complicated uh, kinematic planners for even things like rough terrain where there's dynamic elements. Uh, here's another example of this little seesaw. The character steps up onto it. And it's really amazing to see this because you get so used to a character in a game just being a capsule sliding around. But here, they're really touching the world and their weight is being transferred to the environment. And you can really feel that this character exists in the world rather than just being some rocket powered capsule with magic forces sliding it around. Um, yeah, another demo, just climbing up some stairs. It's nice to see these like off balance behaviors where he'll spread out his arms to regain balance or stumble over a big gap, step over uh, kind of gaps that you would naturally as a person. Uh, and it actually didn't take too much to actually extend their method to do this. We just needed to add a little bit of information in this data about where the next footstep position would be. Another demo, this is another gym we train on where we just spawn a, kind of a bunch of objects in front of the character. Uh, and we see he's running over everything. You see some nice like, uh, step ups and uh long like extensions to find a nice foothold far away from any obstacles uh and i think it looks really good and really natural so just to conclude right what's interesting is physically simulated characters can really provide this new level of physical realism so you can see like this guy walking in a hamster wheel right like that, that's not something you see in games today because Either you need a canned animation specifically for this uh, kind of behavior to look right, or you just have some really wonky looking interaction where you can really tell the character is just represented by a capsule and there's like this footbook plane of an animation. So we can do some new interesting things. I think it opens up a lot of new interesting possibilities for gameplay, um, but there's a lot of new challenges that this brings as well, right? It's, it's hard to get this kind of uh, superhuman strength that players have come to expect of their player of their character um so there's research that remains to be done in actually like moving from this realistic representation to one that's fun to actually play with and that uh kind of captures all of these video game features that you assume a video game should have uh, but i think there's a lot of new avenues that this is going to open up so it's a very interesting direction so I guess we're open to questions now, uh, me or Daniel. Thank you, everyone. For... <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kevin and Kansai, Daniel.
uh, now we can start the Q&A session. Uh, can I so... start, Arbo? Yeah, sure. So um, I have a question about, so for the last portion of your talk, um, did you give to the policy the representation of the environment or it's blind to that? Uh, uh, so you... Go on, Kevin. I, I mean, the environment, I mean, the not the robot or the character itself, it's the, the, the outside of the robot, let's say. So for the rough terrain, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so in these demos, what we essentially provided to the character is two things that kind of, one implicitly gives it information about the terrain. Uh, so this is the actual target pose, right? We're using motion matching to pick a pose and this pose is picked based on the environment. Uh, so motion matching is looking at the terrain uh, basically in a straight line ahead of the character and it's finding the heights of the terrain in front of the character and it's picking an animation that kind of fits this uh, like height map in a 1D sense. Um, so it's getting some implicit information about the terrain policy in terms of the animation. But then there's also some explicit information. We give the height of the terrain with like a ray cast uh, at basically a few points in front of the character. So these are like the footstep, uh, the future footstep positions from the current animation it's playing. Um, but it's not like a whole height field like you see in some papers. We're not actually providing it with like um, like some kind of convolution of the terrain around it. It's really just like a, a few key points in front of the character. And this is enough to get quite nice results like you saw. So um, my question here is about, so let's say you there are some kind of terrain that you have not seen in your training. So there's no notion of planning in your algorithm. Do you think uh, you can extend to, to those kind of things? Right, like if if, the, if it's not in our database, it's not yeah. necessarily going to um, know how to deal with it. But you get into this situation sometimes where there's something that's close enough in the database. Like if you're stepping off a, a block that's one foot high versus a block that's two feet high, it, it'll probably pick that uh, like one foot high stepping down animation, even if it's two feet high. And th then the policy itself may be robust enough to actually accommodate this uh, kind of disturbance. Um, but it, it, it's like, you really want to ask for what's in your database and what you're trained with. So you have to be a little bit careful. Thanks. Yeah, I think the theory is that as long as the kinematic plan is good, usually the, the little policy we have will do a good job of balancing. But if, yeah, if you don't have motion capture data that fits the particular context, there's no way you're going to be able to survive, I think. Okay, next question is, uh, what are the action control inputs that you're using here? And how realistic are, for example, the contact forces? Uh, so the actions are the PD offsets. So we take, the, uh, we take the joint rotations of the kinematic character and we use those as the basic PD target. And then we add some offset, that's what the policy adds. In some of the ex uh, examples shown, I think it's actually outputting the absolute PD targets rather than the offsets. Um, but in most of the videos, it's the offsets. Um, and yeah, the how realistic are the contacts and stuff? Uh, well, the sim is run at a pretty high, it's like 60 Hertz, the, the frame rate of the sim. Um, and, there's, it's, and there's not loads of constraint iteration. So it's kind of geared towards game animation rather than having like a realistic simulator. But uh, I think this is mainly just to prove that it's possible to run at such frame rates. I'm sure you could run the sim in much more realistic settings and it would have no problem functioning. Okay, uh, the next question is, do you consider self collisions? Um, I think we did in, in some setups uh, and it works okay. Um, it, it needs to, it learns a style, which is a bit more like with the legs spread apart because it doesn't want to bang them into each other, but essentially it does work. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think an important point to make uh, for self collisions is a lot of the time, um, it's actually difficult to properly do it because your character model is represented by like these thick rigid bodies to get the proper initial, like inertial properties um, and just the like right collision response in certain areas. 
but then you run into this issue or like for an animation with running your thighs actually rub together a little bit um which is kind of this soft body uh response um so it, it's difficult because you're representing everything with rigid bodies but then if you want to have self collisions you almost need like a second layer of collision geometry that you allow for like these kind of slight deformations or something like thighs rubbing together. Um, so it, it becomes kind of problematic, right? Like you need a character with either really thin limbs and then it's not necessarily gonna have a realistic collision response when it's doing something like sitting on the ground um, or you need like multiple more complicated dynamics to be simulated like for the soft body response of things. Okay, the next question is, uh, will it work with multiplayer? How do For Honor do what is implemented there? And that's the, game, the name of the game, right? Yeah, uh, so essentially uh, on, on For Honor, well, the, the whole animation system is run locally on the, on the client. Um, and so I, this, is, this will probably be the same for things like the physics character simulation. Um, it can get a bit awkward if you get like desynced between clients, but I think fundamentally this is the safest way to work. Um, other games which do have synced physics simulations, it's it's just a huge challenge in general, but I think you could just plug what we did into whatever framework they've built already and it should be able to sync the simulations. For example, they're already doing something to sync ragdolls and stuff like that. Okay, uh, the next question goes for the this motion matchings. Uh, do you do any regularization scaling of the feature for the nearest neighbor search or does a Euclidean distance work well out of the box? Uh, yeah, you need to scale the features. So we scale them based on their standard deviations to sort of normalize them. And then you can also have like a user waiting to try and make some features more important or less important. Um, but uh, if you do have everything scaled appropriately, then yeah, the Euclidean distance is fine. You don't need a fancier, you don't need a fancier distance than this. Okay, the next question is, uh, I have a slightly more specific question. In your DERCOM paper, when you blend the output of the kinematic controller and the controller offset that come from the policy controller, you apply a low pass filter. Why is there a low pass filter? Uh, I guess I could answer that, right? Um, part of it is just, it helps the training converge better, right? So you, you don't necessarily need this filter over everything. Uh, but we found it helps a little bit uh, to just smooth out uh, like high frequency variations that your controller can output. So with PPO, you kind of have this problem, uh, right, where you're sampling from a distribution of actions. Um, and if you're just directly sending those actions to your motors, you're going to get lots of jerky movement. Uh, so to kind of eliminate these vibrations, it's nice to constrain it to basically sample lower frequency behaviors. There's multiple ways you could do this, but we do it just with this low pass filter. But it works without it. It's more just to, it actually harms the like robustness of the policy a little bit, but it gives you better visual quality. So there's a little trade off there with this filter. Yeah, I think it's easier to think about this filter as part of the environment rather than as part of the learning setup. I right. think of it like as almost as part of the PD control or something itself. It's just It's just something that's modifying the actions before they get sent to the robot. Yeah, it's, it's like actually you you actually add like fake actuator dynamics, so you don't have like these really infinitely powerful motors. Uh, uh, Magic. Yeah. So I have one more question. Um, so do you think uh, it's it's more about the future of game? I would say. You think in the future you will try to uh, just have the motion from from uh, motion capture data for all the kind of motions that you are interested. For instance, in the videos you, you could see that the robot would or the a character would fall down, but there is no way that it wait, you know uh, it gets up. Do you think in the future you would need to just um, 
simulate all of that and sample and use something like TPU or reinforcement learning to, to have all the motions, or you think you will need to have a more efficient way such that you can generate new kind of behaviors without having access to the data that is collected from human or another animal, let's say. Yeah, I, I think it would be nice if you could actually uh, like not have to sample everything in motion capture ahead of time. Uh, so like, obviously, if, if you could, you'd want to do like MPC for every single decision you make. Uh, the problem is that this is like ridiculously expensive, right? So if you had dedicated hardware to do physics simulation and these kinds of optimizations, then maybe it'd be possible. Um, in terms of being the future of like all games, I don't know. I don't know if every game necessarily wants to take this approach of physically simulating everything. Sometimes uh, they like this kind of more abstract uh, gamified approach to things. But if you were trying to physically simulate everything, I think in the future you need to do something a bit smarter than what we're doing right now. Um, so like you said, for getting up these kinds of behaviors, they're actually very hard. Uh, and it's actually like combinatorially like difficult, right? To sample every possible get up from every possible fall configuration. So there needs to be some kind of, um, at least some rough sense, of some me either memorized or online little optimization you can do to actually find different plans. Um, but yeah, that, that's, I guess, my perspective. I don't know what the actual future will be necessarily. Yeah, I think um, it's sure that like, you're not going to simulate, you're not going to do a physical simulation of a guy walking down the street, like 10 meters away, especially if the goal of your simulation is to look as close as possible to the reference, <laughs> then there's no point, you know, so there will always be some hybrid between, uh, or at least switching. In terms of like the amount of data required, uh, I guess the way I see it as is that you always need to control the output of your system somehow. So if you're doing something like MPC, yes, you may be able to get up in some cases, but the animation may look weird or it may not be what people want. So then you have to ask yourself, how do you control that? There are many ways so you could add some priors like some cost functions you could try and minimize energy you could try and do lots and lots of different things but uh, or you could build some artistic tools for artists to interact with it my personal philosophy is that at the end of the day the only real approach that scales is a data-based approach where you try and capture more data to cover the situations you want everything else it either requires complex mathematical equations or it requires artists to work with very complicated tools. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens. I suspect uh, that ch change is going to be long and difficult for everyone. But yeah, I, I personally, that I think it's the only way to build these hugely complex worlds in a scalable way that doesn't require just insane amounts of manpower or very specifically tweaked systems. Thanks. Okay, uh, next question. Um, although you have impressive performance, it seems that uh, this is still not enough with respect to the constraints you mentioned earlier in the presentation. My question is, do you have any leads on how to improve further the performance of the framework? Is the motion quality of thing considered acceptable for AAA games at this point? Or do you think this also needs additional research? Um, okay, so in terms of performance, what we had in the paper was like 360 microseconds roughly, but that includes the physics sim. That's actually pretty good. So usually most games these days are reserving something like a millisecond or two for the whole of their physics tick. Um, so if we can get everything inside that big physics tick, it's probably actually pretty close to what, what we need. What we just need to make sure happens is that, you know, you see some artifacts in bullet, sometimes like the joints pulling apart or weird collisions and big twists, which all look like it's from the sim, either not having enough sub steps or some weird popping in the constraints. So I guess the question is, uh, can we still do a physics tip of tick of one to two milliseconds, but have really uh, good uh, actuated characters, which don't 
pop and do like weird things when they're running around. Um, and I, I think it's possible. We've done some improvements since then and we have something that looks pretty good. So I think it's possible in terms of the motion quality. Yeah, I think in this, this role results we showed here, they're a little bit low, partially due to what I said about the constraints and the popping and stuff. But uh, I think, yeah, more recently we've been working on some stuff and we, we're starting to get much more better, much better results in terms of quality. So I think actually it's, we're pretty close now to getting it within the performance budget and sort of quality constraints. So that's really promising because it, it solves a whole big open question that was a very, very um, big unknown, I guess, for the last couple of years about whether these things could be used in games. Uh, so do you think that this motion generation method is applicable to real robotic tasks? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, I would say yes. Um, I mean, this doesn't initialize your standard kind of planner that you have. Um, it's really good to just have a database of a tons of tons of different examples of what you want your character to do and to just pick the nearest one, right? And then if you want to do some kind of refinement so that you actually respect your dynamic constraints, uh, constraints with respect to the environment and all these kinds of things, um, then you can do that on top, right? It's, it's, uh, essentially, you're going to initialize your, your planner with this, and then you're going to probably have to do some more complicated planning with respect to friction and these kinds of things. Um, but it should still work, right? It'll give you a much better approximation than if you just initialize, initialize the character in a T-pose or with its previous plan or something like this. Yeah, for me, the, the main takeaway in terms of robotics is like, if you can make a really good kinematic plan, which looks really realistic, you don't actually need a very sophisticated like closed loop policy at all um, to be very robust at least in a simulator environment. I can't talk about it in a real environment, but at least in a simulator, that definitely seems to be the case. And so maybe investing more time on the kinematic plan can actually make the, uh, the dynamic planning much, much, much easier. That's, that's, that would be my main takeaway, I think. Okay. Uh... Any thoughts on learn, uh, learning motion matching, which seems to reduce a lot of memory needs associated to the motion matching database? Yeah, so, uh, so we, we can use, uh, in fact, some of the videos we showed are from learned motion matching. So we, we, use, we use both of them uh, interchangeably as, as the planner. Uh, 